As we conclude the season of Epiphany next week when we study the Transfiguration, that will be the conclusion of this amazing season following Christmas. The lectionary gives us this morning a more difficult text, a text that we've heard many times, and I'm sure that as we've listened, we've also wondered, what does this really mean? And the text is actually uh, from the Gospel of Matthew. It continues from that beautiful Sermon on the Mount, but it presents us with a challenge, especially, I think, in modern day. So uh, I'm reading this message this morning from Eugene Peterson's The Message because he gives this text, which we all know, a twist, a new twist. The, uh, the subtitle of uh, this particular part of Matthew is called Love Your Enemies. Here's another old saying that deserves a second look. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Is that going to get us anywhere? Here's what I propose. Don't hit back at all. If someone strikes you, stand there and take it. If someone drags you into court and sues you for the shirt off your back, gift wrap your best coat and make a present of it. And if someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice the servant life. No more tit-for-tat stuff. Live generously. You're familiar with the old written law, love your friend, and its unwritten companion, hate your enemy. I'm challenging that. I'm telling you to love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the energies of prayer, for then you are working out your true selves, your God-created selves. This is what God does. God gives us God's best the sun to warm, and the rain to nourish, to everyone, regardless, good or bad, the nice and the nasty. If all you do is love the lovable, do you expect a bonus? Anybody can do that. If you simply say hello to those who greet you, do you expect a medal? Any run-of-the-mill sinner can do that. In a word, what I'm saying to you is, grow up. You're kingdom subjects. Now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously toward others, the way God lives toward you. And may God add a blessing to the reading and the challenge of this amazing text. Well, it was just a few days before Christmas, and I found myself down on 4th Street in Berkeley with a few minutes of free time and, of course, the ever-present shopping list. I was lucky as I drove into 4th Street to find a curbside parking space, one of those great 24 minutes of free parking in a metered zone that seduces us into thinking, great, I have a lot of free time and plenty of time to get my shopping done, 24 minutes. I parked my car, I thought I did a great job, locked the door and began to walk across the street. I heard a voice behind me saying, I thought it was a man's voice, saying something to me like, you women just don't know how to park. I looked at my car, I checked out the truck, his truck behind it. The truck was one of those big things, you know, that you can haul a trailer uh, behind, and it was a little beaten up, it had big tires, one of those kind of rev them up trucks. My old Prius was at least a foot from his bumper and not in his parking area at all. But apparently, this man did not like my parking job. I told him, nicely, that my car was not touching his truck. Lady, you still don't know how to park. I felt irritation and some anger begin to bubble up in me. 
I could feel my face turning red. Are you with me here? My hands trembling and my heart rate kaboom, 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 really rising. I almost opened my mouth to say something mean and nasty. I kept my fingers curled, but I turned around and I began to walk away. But this man was looking for a fight. Go ahead, lady, walk away. You can't park a car for nothing. It took everything I had to keep walking away. I turned into the first door that I could find and I hid behind it, wondering if this person was going to come after me. I realized, hanging around behind that door, that I was shaking, but that I was more angry than scared, more bewildered than frightened, and even at that point, fighting a strong desire to scream a few well-chosen words at this stranger who clearly had it in for me. I fantasized a face-off, and I even thought for an instant about a Tony Soprano moment. (laughs) I was Tony Soprano! I also realized that I had clearly done the best and only thing we can do in those anxious and angry moments. Walk away before it escalates. You're laughing, but I know that you all have been there. What kind of person do you want to be? Jesus asks this of us in this morning's scripture. What kind of life do you want to live? Do you want to embrace the violence of our culture? Or can you find another way to live? Are you basically as cynical and critical as those who are around you are? Or have you figured out and have you come to that place in yourself where you have the strength to go about your life in a different way? Do you sit around remembering just who owes you a favor or a phone call or forgot to pay for the dinner the last time, leaving you with the bill yet again? Do you hold on to what's coming to you as your due? Can you count in your life, on one hand, those who trust you and those whom you trust? Do you watch, guard, and protect your own bottom line and make sure that no one, no one, threatens it. Although Jesus calls us in this morning's text to love our neighbor, he quickly admits that there is such a thing in everyone's life as enemies. There are people who actually work against us, who poison the well of our existence. In each life, there are people who simply don't like us, although we're incredibly likable, and even turn up their noses or ignore us when we walk by. It's part of human nature, and it's part of life. We know that we can't love all of the people all of the time. But Jesus suggests in this text an approach different than the one we are accustomed to using. It's not the Tony Soprano approach. It's not even the live and let live mantra many of us employ when we simply cannot understand or tolerate another person. Jesus goes another way. He says to us, anyone can love their friends. It's easy and it's natural. In fact, it's why they are our friends, because we love them and we can love them. But Jesus says the real measure of love is the ability you have to drum up some compassion in your being for those who you would never find at your dining room table or even those who don't want anything to do with you because they would never invite you to their dining room table. Loving our friends, those who look like us, act like us, and even love like us. That's the easy part. Even tax collectors can do that, Jesus says in this text. But learning to love your enemies 
is the real challenge, and that is at the core of the gospel message. Have any of you followed the Michael Dunn murder trial in Florida this past month? Dunn, Michael Dunn, was parked outside of a 7 to 11 while his fiancée went inside to pick up a few things. The SUV beside him had a couple of teenagers inside it, and they were listening to some music and had turned up the volume. Jordan Davis was 17 years old, African-American, and moving to the beat of the music. He and Mr. Dunn, a white 47-year-old man, had a few words about the music. Then Dunn swears that he saw the barrel of a shotgun come out the back window and that he heard the words, I'm going to kill you, come from the back seat of the car. So he reached into his glove compartment, took out a gun, and fired into the back of the car ten times. Jordan Davis died before he got to the hospital. When the cops came to look at the car, there was no gun in the back of the SUV. At his trial, Michael Dunn contended that he acted in self-defense. Just two weeks ago, on February 7, the jury convicted him of two counts of manslaughter, but because of Florida's stand-your-ground law, the jury was unable to come to agreement about first-degree murder. The jury is hung, and Dunn's lawyers are preparing for an appeal. If Michael Dunn had taken one moment to think of the young man in the backseat of the car as his own son, or even himself at the tender age of 17, this terrible moment might have been averted. If Michael Dunn had taken a moment to press through his fear and simply back his car in reverse out of the parking lot, it might have had a different outcome. But we live in an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth world, and it is compounded by racial racial hatred gun violence, and laws like stand your ground, which justify aggression. Preacher Frederick Beekner talks about how we allow our mistrust and our hatred to smolder inside of us throughout our lives. It eats away at our core, and we don't know when or in what kind of situation it will suddenly erupt. This is the second time that the shooting of a young black man in Florida has made the national news. Both times, fear and anger escalated, and a black teenager died. Both times, the scene would have played out differently if we had heeded Jesus' words, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of God. When we hear that we should love our enemies and pray for them, we are not talking about that sweet, coddling kind of love, the sentimental love that many of us desire to have. We are describing love as willing for the good, willing for the good of another rather than the destruction. It's a hard thing to do. Ask an African-American who lives in Florida, or a college fresh woman who has been slipped a drug at a party. Ask a Syrian who has just carried his child out of a bombed house. Ask a Somali in a refugee camp. It's a hard thing to do, to love without sentimentality, to wish for good rather than retribution, especially when we've been wronged, to be willing to forgive when we've been deeply and utterly wronged. Jordan Davis's mother, Lucia McBath, spoke about her son on Good Morning America this past week. Strangely to me, she did not weep or blame or shrink from the issues at hand. She said she believed the jurors did the best they could do with the laws that they had. She made it clear that she believes our nation's existing laws do not protect Jordan or millions of other victims of gun violence in America. 
She made it clear that we are victims of our own violence and our own mistrust of each other and that our gun laws support our need for retribution and violence. Justice, she says, will be when we change our laws, when we change the laws that allow us to hate our enemies and supply justification for it. You need to be perfect, like God is perfect, Jesus says to us after all of this. Wow. We need to forgive. We need to turn the other cheek. We need to love our enemies. And oh, guess what? We get to be perfect. I imagine that you are sitting here this morning thinking it's too much. But I think that Jesus is using the word perfect in another way. Perfect means to him to be whole, to be wholehearted, to be whole-making, to be whole-souled. I believe that Jesus struggled with this, all of that wholeness, just as much as we do. But he didn't give up on himself, and he didn't give up on God's ability to create a new heart inside of him. And we remember that as Jesus' life ended, he begged God to forgive those who were hurting him. We cannot deny the difficulty of all this by simply saying we should strive for perfection. Sometimes we are hurt so badly by others that it is best for us to care from them from a great distance. Sometimes the process of forgiveness, forgiving someone for what they have done to us, the wound is so deep and so profound, it may take your entire life to deal with it. Sometimes the pain is so raw, we have to embrace the AA saying to let go and let God handle it. But the bottom line remains, what kind of person do you want to be? In a world of self-justifying hate, rampant violence, and mean-spirited desires, what bottom line do you want to carry inside of yourself? In a book called The Country of My Skull, there is a scene in the South African Truth and Reconciliation hearing that I hold out as the way I want to live. There are reports in the midst of the Truth and Reconciliation hearings of human rights violation, cross-examination of, ap of, ex of applicants for Truth and Reconciliation, both black and white, and stories of reparation and rehabilitation. In one of the hearings, a young boy from the township must hear the story of how his parents were brutally killed by police in a raid. As a policeman tells the story, he weeps uncontrollably, and he tells the young boy that he is deeply ashamed and regretful of that night when he obeyed orders to control a mass protest in the township. He doesn't know if he actually shot the boy's parents, but he is certain that he has fired into the crowd on that terrible night. The young boy listens as the policeman tells him that he is sorry and that if he will come with him, he will bring him home to his house and raise him in his family as if he were his own child. The policeman says that it's the only way he can live with the hurt and the evil that he has caused. The young boy's face is impassive. He ponders whether to go toward forgiveness or remain in the clutches of hate. He moves toward the policeman who is frozen in place, holding his breath and anticipating, perhaps in a moment, a sharp right hook. But the young boy does something amazing. He comes into the policeman's arms and he hugs him and hangs around his neck. Quietly, they dissolve into an embrace that allows each one to live again. 
and tells each one never, never to return to a life of violence and hate. Be whole as God is whole. Be forgiving as that young boy and be ashamed of violence and anger as that policeman. Jesus is molding for us a certain kind of heart, a different kind of heart, a new kind of heart. That heart is whole. It is whole making. It's whole seeking. It's nonviolent. It is open, daring, and forgiving. What is your bottom line? Amen.